I am here because uh, I'm just an average average guy. <clears throat> but 30 years ago, I got together with some gentlemen and some partners, and we did start a company from scratch, from dirt, by mortgaging our homes. And 30 years later, the company is doing about $150 million dollars in sales and manufacturing. So something we did over those years, we certainly must have done correctly. What I'd like to do initially is just talk about some of my personal experiences because I am a pretty average guy and some of the things I learned. So if I use I some in the beginning, please forgive me. I remember the first job I ever had when I was about 13 or 14. I was raised up in the coal regions in Pennsylvania in the anthracite coal region area. And it wasn't long, long after that that anthracite became obsolete, and, of course, the movement was to purchase bituminous coal. So you can imagine it was not a very uh, wealthy-type neighborhood. But the first job I ever had, I worked in a hobby shop. Uh, and in those days, the houses were heated with coal, so my responsibility was to stock the shelves. And then on Friday night, this owner of the hobby shop would go to a flea market and sell his goods. And I had one important responsibility, and that was to keep the stove full, and the furnace full of coal. and had a hopper on it. And Friday night, I had to be sure I put coal in that hopper. Well, one Friday, 13-year-old guy forgot to do that. And, uh, boy, it got really cold in that house when that man came home that night. And I learned one reliable, one thing then early on that you had to be reliable in your job responsibility, that you could easily get fired. And that still stuck with me today. Do you remember your first job, Dick? Yes. Do you remember learning anything from it? I learned how to uh, cut up a chicken for you. <laughs> the second job I had, I learned something else. Going to college in the summertime, obviously, I had to work, so I worked for a building contractor. And obviously, working for a building contractor, the chores they gave me were the chores that they didn't want to do themselves. And you can get pretty bored and tired in digging holes and trenches. And I remember one summer we had a job digging uh, septic tanks. We were paid $3 a foot, so you'd dig this hole, and my partner and I, we started digging, and you know, the first day or two, you did pretty well until you got down about 10 or 15 feet, and then you only did about a, a foot every six or seven hours, so I realized then that uh, building homes could be challenging if you're the owner of the company, but being the, the laborer really, really wasn't very, very interesting. So the third thing I learned, though, was when I went to work in Alabama for a company called Lockheed Space and Missile Company. This was after I got out of the service, and uh, I, I went to work, and it was back when Sputnik first occurred, and, you know, people were hiring engineers. If you had an engineering degree, you could easily, easily get a job. And the first job I had was they, they put me in a cubicle in this large building, and, and honestly, I'd go in in the morning, and it was dark in the wintertime. I'd come home at night, and it was dark. I never saw the daylight, you know, just in this cubicle, working on differential equations, and I realized that this there had to be a better way. There had to be some better way of making a living with some variety in it. It was just, it was totally ennui that just encapsulated me. I just was so bored. I said, I have to find something new. And it made me realize that in my subconscious, I was starting to learn things. I was learning from mistakes. I was learning things I didn't want to do and led me on the path of, of being what Mark calls an entrepreneur. I remember when my, my daughter graduated from Auburn University four years ago. She was an English major, and she came home, and it was uh, May, and she sat up in her bedroom. She was almost crying. She said, Dad, she said, you know, I, I really don't know what I want to do. I said, I don't, what am, what's going to happen to me? So we sat down, and we started talking on the bed. I can remember it to this day. I said, well, let's list the things that you don't want to do. And I said, could you be satisfied working in an office or a building where you went to the same desk every day and had no variety. And she says, no, I, I wouldn't want to do this. But there are many people that get enjoyment out of that. In my company, we had a structural engineer, and every day he goes into his office at his computer and he works on structural formulas and structural ideas, and he's happy with it, and he's a major contributor to the company. But for Mary, my daughter, that that's not what she wanted. So we listed all of the things we she didn't want to do, so we were left with one or two things that she did want to do. So that embarked her on her eventual career that, uh, that, that brought her much happiness. If you've had a chance to look at these notes, what I've done is I've, I've listed seven or eight suggestions that you might consider if you're going to be successful in business, 
and more importantly, if you're ever dreaming about having your own business. And I th- suggestion number one is, is to be involved with as many people and as many organizations as you can. Obviously, I'm directing that towards someone like Dick, who's relatively young compared to the speaker. But I think there are so many ways you can learn what opportunities are out in front of you. You have to have wide vision. You can't be myoptic. And I mentioned in here that I learned a lot initially, you know, in a health club. You can go to a health club and you can talk about someone and learn about the experiences that they have. Uh, another good place is church. Now, I'm not suggesting you go to church for anything other than sacred reasons, but there are really some wonderful people at church where you can learn about the experiences of, of so many different people. I collect antique cars, and you never stop learning. I, I just met somebody a couple of weeks ago who, in Birmingham, started off, he and his wife, with a gasoline station, just a simple little gasoline station. And today he has the franchise rights for BP Oil and Chevron. I, I bet he, he's a multimillionaire starting out with just a little gas station. The nice thing about the gas station business is it's cash. And that, that, that's a nice feature if you have responsibility of paying taxes. I've always dreamed of having a bar where people pay in cash. I think that'd be a, I think that'd be a, a nice, uh, nice opportunity. In this suggestion, number one, I do make one profound suggestion. That, that is, if you are thinking about getting into something uh, for the first, into something for sure, you, you really need to have worked in that field prior to it. Uh, it would be a tragic mistake to go into some type of a business having never experienced what it's like to work in that business. I think... Um, One exception might be is if you're looking at getting into a franchise business, then you are paying a franchise fee for the experiences that that they they can pass on to you. The second suggestion is to really be recognize your weaknesses and to do something about it. And when I was about 22 or 23 years old, having graduated from engineering school, you can imagine that engineers have a pretty limited vocabulary. Technically, I had a good vocabulary, but, boy, I could not write. I couldn't write a paper or a report worth a darn. And I recognized that I had to do something about it. And I found the most enjoyable way to correct that weakness was to start reading novels, because in in college, I never read many novels. I read technical books. I I enjoyed books about Einstein and theory of relativity, but never many novels. So I started reading by an author called uh, Taylor Caldwell. Have you, any of you ever heard of Taylor Caldwell? Yeah. You had that? Boy, I'll tell you, she wrote probably 12 or 13 or 14 incredible, incredible books. And the first one she wrote, of course, as I mentioned, his paper is Captains and Kings. And I sat down, I read that book, and I read about five or six pages, and there were three or four words I never, I didn't understand. So what I did was I... I would write the words down, and I'd write them on a little notebook, and I'd keep the notebook with me. And every day I'd review the notebook, and after about three or four mo- months, I realized my vocabulary was, was increasing and that, uh, that I was correcting a weakness. So I think it's absolutely imperative if you're thinking about going into business, or even if you're going to be a businessman for some other large company, to, to recognize your weaknesses early on. The third suggestion is, uh, as I mentioned, is don't venture into something that is uh, you you haven't been in before. I I feel like I've always wanted to own an Italian restaurant. I love pasta. I love Italian food. But it would be impossible to have a successful Italian restaurant if you'd ever worked in it yourself. You have to have, if you want to get into a business like that, Obviously, Jeff, I'd have to go in and have a partner who knew how to cook because I can't cook. So he would be a key employee. And if you're going to try and structure a company like that, you would want that key employee to be locked in with you for the life of the business. And that's where you'd want to you improvise and possibly make the chef a part owner in the company or give him some type of a pay package where you know he's never going to leave you and compete, compete with you. Suggestion number four is to realize that in starting a business, it does entail 
combining different skills and diversities of different people. And to start a business, you have to start it with a business plan. And I guess speaking to economic students and economic professors, you've obviously done a business plan before, but in case you haven't, can I just go over a real simple one with you? Somewhere you should have that business plan. Yeah. Yeah. I remember my dad, when he retired from Pennsylvania, came down to Alabama to be with the grandchildren. He, he had a dream of having a hot dog stand. And so I said, Dad, let's, let's just do a little simple business plan. And he went through his business plan and he forgot to include his salary. So the guy actually, my dad actually would have gone into this business and it would have failed because of the fact that he didn't do the business plan. Again, being an engineer, what I've done here is imagine a company similar to the one I had. And it was involving steel fabrication. I'll talk a little bit about it, more about it later on. But when we put our business plan together 30 years ago, uh, it, it didn't take a lot of cash to start a business back in those days. I remember to this day, I still have a copy of the $5,000 check I wrote to the bank to get, get, get the business started. But it does require some collateral, some going to the bank and borrowing money. In order to do that, you have to know how much money to borrow. And that's where the business plan comes in. And again, I apologize if it's too fundamental to you, but it's a simple business plan involving something like our business, which would be steel fabrication. And I did it for one year. And you notice under January, I have projected sales. If you're envisioning putting a company together... Chances are you're not going to book business and ship products the first month you're in business. It may take two or three or four months. Then the second thing I have is what is the cost of sales. In our business, we had a steel manufacturing plant. So we had to buy steel. We had to buy welding rods. We had to pay welders. So you have to have some cost associated with sales in the first month, even though you're not manufacturing anything, because you have to have a plant superintendent. You have to have... Foreman, you have to hire people, you have to set up equipment, you have to set up your building and so forth. So the first month in this example, you actually do have some cost of sales. Your G&A is your general administrative cost, the cost that's fixed. That's the cost of the president, the cost of the salesman, the cost of advertising, the cost of the office, the telephone, the secretarial cost. It's always there. So in this particular example, the first year we've lost $30,000. Pretty much the second month went on the same way as I would envision our company. You, you're just simply not going to sell a product and ship it until some period of time elapses. So it's not uncommon for a business like ours to go two months before you actually start shipping a product. But you do have continuing costs. So now by the end of the second month, you're already lost $60,000. Now the third month, um, we finally start having book business recorded business, manufactured, and shipped it out the door. So the first month, we have shipment of $40,000, cost of sales $30,000. So in this particular example, the gross margin is around a 25% gross margin. Are you familiar, Dick, with what I, what I say by gross margin? The, the gross margin, in my, in my interpretation, is, is the, the percentage of, of cost to manufacture the product. So if you have a... Uh, you're manufacturing a $40,000 machine. If it costs $30,000 in the plant to manufacture it, that's your laborers, your material you have to buy, your welding rods and so forth. That's your actual shop cost. So what is left over is, is the gross margin, which in this case is 10%. This month, now this month the third month, uh, I envision the fact that the company now is going to start growing. So by then, you probably would have hired some additional people, some salespeople. You may have done some advertising. So your G&A jumps up, and for once now, instead of losing $30,000, we've only lost $20,000 that, that second month. And this continues on with the same type of pattern. And you can see by the end of the first year, this company would have lost about, uh, would have lost about $65,000. Now, in addition to this, you have to have other cash to start the company. You have to have startup costs. You have to be able to go out and rent a building or buy a building. You've got to buy manufacturing equipment. You have to hire people and so forth. 
So this has to be the absolute beginning point if you're envisioning and starting any type of a business. Why does everything fall off in December here? Typically in December is a, is a period of when not many orders are received. You don't, there's not a lot of activity. You have people taking vacations. Uh, you have long, you have Thanksgiving, you have Christmas holidays and so forth. So that pattern is pretty typical. I guess I subconsciously did it because in my business that actually did happen. Thanks, Mark. Sure was a Ford Motor Company. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be involved with Ford or General Motors uh, retirement programs right now. Uh, once you put the business plan together, now you need certain people to have a company. Again, I, you know, in my subconscious, I'm envisioning my company. And the starting point is to have to have something to sell. You have to have a product. You have to have an idea. And you certainly have to have a marketing plan. And in order to put this business plan together, Jeff, you need the marketing guy because the marketing guy should be aware of the competition and should be able to predict the gross margin of the product you're going to sell because not knowing the gross margin, without knowing that, you can't put the business plan together. You have to know your cost of manufacturing and what you can sell it for above that number. So the marketing guy is, is, is awfully important. And you can be enthusiastic. I think every entrepreneur is enthusiastic and has a passion for it. But you must get into something like this realizing that there is going to be competition. And you're probably going to be competing against the well-established large companies, which is extremely, extremely difficult. Even if you have a unique product that you feel is unique, it may or may not be protected with a patent. But even if it's unique, believe me when I tell you, when people start observing your success, They'll be competing with you. So you have to envision this as a situation where you're always going to have some competition. The bad thing about competition is, is that it keeps your gross margins down. The, uh, the fellow putting the ideas together then needs to absolutely be conscious and be well knowledgeable of the competition and the strength and weaknesses of the competition. The second guy is really, really important. I was blessed with a partner who was a, an accountant. And he's obviously very different from, from my traits. I, I'm enthusiastic and, boy, I'd go into him and say, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to add another product and say, oh, let's do a business plan. Accountants, are there any accountants in the room? No accountants. I've really been blessed by having a good friend as an accountant. And this guy is as tall as, as Mark. But he, he's very reserved and very quiet and very, very pessimistic about everything. I mean, really pessimistic. I'm pessimistic. <laughs> when we did put a, a plan together, as I mentioned in here, if you have had a chance to look at it, is I think it's a good idea to put two marketing plans together. And the sales guy, the marketing guy, the guy with the ideas on the products needs to work in unison with the accountant. And it's probably wise for the salesman, the guy with a lot of enthusiasm, to be a little bit weaker in personality than the accountant. And that was fortunately our situation, not because he was physically bigger, but he was, he was knowledgeable from a business standpoint that I respected. So uh, the business plan I mean, has to be put together by the accountant uh, because you have to, and the accountant is critical also so that you continue to have good cost data, good sales data, good profitability data. Every month, we, he would hand us a financial statement that not only told us what our profit was or what our losses were, but every month we had a statement that told us the gross margin of each product. So as the company grew, yes, it started off with one product, general steel fabrication. But today at $150 million a year in sales, there are endless number of products. We develop products over the years. But this accountant, every day, he I mean, every month, we knew exactly where we stood from a cost standpoint, a manufacturing cost standpoint. I was asked to get involved with a company over, over in Georgia that's having some financial problems. They make rubber products. And the first thing I went and asked the accountant for is, let me see your manufacturing cost data. They had no idea how much it costs to manufacture their product. And it was a 60 or $70 million a year company. They just didn't have the accounting 
information to know where they stand. So in any company, whether it's a big company or a small company, the accountant is, is absolutely vital, absolutely vital. The um, other thing you have to have when you're starting a business is some relationships with outside people. And by the time you get to this point, you probably have developed a relationship with some banker, an individual plus a banking company. Because in order to fund the start of this company, you, you probably are not going to be able to do it on your own. You're going to need some financial assistance. And the best thing to do is to go to a banker and develop a close relationship with him to see if he'll let you borrow the money. Now, back in the 1960s, when we, 70s, when we started this company, it wasn't this, the banking rules weren't as strict as they are today. Back then, you didn't have to collateralize everything. But I believe if you went to start a company today and you went to Compass Bank or you went to AMSAL, they would require you to provide collateral for every penny that you're going to borrow. One alternative to that is if you don't have the collateral, is to go to a venture capitalist. And venture capitalists are generally very, very wealthy individuals who have excess money that they'd like to invest in growing companies because their objective is to gain about 20% uh, return on their investment. They're looking for a high return on their investment. So that is, that's one possibility. I, I would discourage that if at all possible because as the company grows and as it becomes successful, the value of the stock is going to continually rise and it's going to be ever more difficult for you to buy your stock back. But it is, it is one recourse is to go to venture capitalists in there and you can go to the banker and the banker generally knows people who you can go to. I was really surprised at starting the company that, uh, we got very, very, very little zero assistance actually from local governments, state governments. Uh, realizing you're starting a manufacturing company, you obviously are going to be creating jobs. So you would think that the local municipality would give you some type, even a tax breaks. And I don't know whether we did it incorrectly, but we absolutely got zero help from government agencies. We had to do it all on our own. You might think, well, why don't you go public with the company, sell stock? The cost to sell stock and to, to develop that type of a concept is very, very expensive. Generally, companies that go to a stock option or sell it, go public, are companies that are already established and they need funding to uh, supply growth. Those are the companies that generally go go public. Like I know Health South did that, for example. Uh, in our company, again, we needed we had someone who could envision the product, who knew something about the product, and we had a darn good accountant who could put the business plan together and control cost. And again, I've got to emphasize the importance of keeping your uh, startup costs low. I saw Mark's office today, and it's a, it's a beautiful office. I, I can tell you in our company, we, we had very, very inexpensive offices. Uh, my kids, as they were going through high school and college, they'd come down and they'd laugh at it. But we kept our, our initial cost as, as low as possible, and I think that's a good rule to follow. But it, in, a, in a company of this type, you have to have someone who can design the product, who can engineer the product, and who can manufacture the product. So when we started our company, we realized we had to have someone that could run the manufacturing facility, who could put it together, who knew where to go out and buy the used equipment uh, to put the, the manufacturing facility together. And then we needed someone who could design the product. Now, that that's, doesn't necessarily have to be an engineer, but it has to be someone who can take the idea and put it on paper in the form of a drawing that it could go into the shop and be manufactured. Alabama is a heavy industry state. There's a lot of steel manufacturing in Alabama. And the supply of these skilled people is really diminishing. It's getting very, very, very difficult to hire draftsmen anymore. So these are the type of people that you've got to have the foresight to realize you can't have them leave. Once you get them on board, they've got to be there forever. So those are the type of people that you might give minority stock ownership to. Legal. Legal help is, is absolutely imperative. To put the company together, you have to have a lawyer draw up all the various contracts, the stocks and so forth, and, and he would, he would uh, draw up your, uh, your, uh, all, all of your legal documents. And he's going to be required ongoing as the company grows. I'll give you an example. We had a construction superintendent 
who hired a worker, and he was from Poland, and he had a safety hat on, and he had Polak on the top of his helmet, safety hat. And one day, I guess he got mad at the superintendent, and he filed his lawsuit against us. He says, it's discrimination. The superintendent's calling me a Polak. Well, I, you won't believe this, but uh, our insurance company ended up paying $40,000. It, it's unbelievable the number of lawsuits that you're going to constantly encounter. And some of them are trivial, but some of them aren't. We had a situation where a large crane, uh, from an insurance standpoint, we always rent a crane with the operator. And we had a situation where the operator of the crane extended a boom too far and a crane collapsed. Uh, and uh, that was about a four or $500,000 lawsuit that we got involved with. So the, the attorneys are, are always there. In the steel fabricating business, the construction business, it's dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous businesses in the world. We've had employees killed. So having a good relationship with a reliable lawyer, knowing him on a personal basis is an ongoing situation that you have to you have to consider. Did you have a lawyer in your company or just someone on the outside? Just the outside. Yeah. I think you really, Mark, have to get into billion dollar companies or 500 million dollar companies before you start affording a uh, a legal counsel. We never had an airplane either. I always went on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> the accountant said no to the airplane. <laughs> Again, suggestion six is persistence. Uh, obviously, uh, it is important. One of the prices I paid, though, was being in the sales end of it, I, I had required to travel quite a bit, and that and that can be tiring. That can be tiring, especially when you're raising a small children. In those days, the children were, you know, three, four, five, ten years old, and I always had a policy that when I did travel, boy, I worked as hard and as long as I could when I was gone, so that I could get back and maximize the amount of time I could, time I could be back in Birmingham, Alabama. And that, that meant leaving 5 o'clock airline flights, coming in the last flight at night. That's, that's one thing I absolutely I did as a necessity. It's something that it's a price you have to pay. And it's difficult because I remember I'd come home uh, and Sue would say, boy, the, Sean, the son, he's got a problem in school. You've got to go help him with his math or... They did something wrong, and boy, it's so stressful. You want to come home and you want to hug them, and all of a sudden your spouse is saying you got to discipline them. <laughs> and it really, it really is can be awfully stressful. I think also in persistence is that you you uh, you must reduce your debt as quickly as as possible. What you want to do is have a company that eventually is free of your banking responsibility, where well, you're not borrowing money to operate on. And again, that's where the partner of having a really strong accountant really is an asset. I, I, I like to spend money. I, I do. My partner likes to accumulate money. And, and that is really, really an important factor in why we succeeded. He wouldn't let us spend money. For the first 10 or 15, you know, $150 million a year company, obviously we were, had to be making money. And... I know up until uh, my daughter went, went, my one daughter went to Auburn and the other daughter went to Sanford. And when, when the older daughter was at Sanford, she'd come home and our, we had an average house. You know, I didn't drive Cadillacs. I drove Buicks or Chevys. And people said, what? Why are you working so hard? Well, what was happening during that period of time was the fact that we were reducing debt. We were getting buildings paid for. For example, we kept our manufacturing plants as a limited partnership where the owners had them, so we collected rent from those buildings. Well, it took 15 years to get the buildings paid off. And it wasn't until later in life that I started realizing, you know, I'm making money. You know, rather than just looking at it on paper, I was starting to get my rewards simply because the accountant was really a strong guy, and he said, we're going to reduce debt. We got to the point that we weren't borrowing any money. And that made it possible to do what was right. That was, as we grew the company, we hired young people out of college. And they stayed with us for 15 and 20 years and helped us grow the company. They were part of the company. They, they learned, we all learned together. And by retiring debt, then, we had an option that was ethically correct. 
rather than selling the company to a large conglomerate who'd pay two or three times book value, we had the luxury of being able to pass the company on to these young people and let them pay us over time at an affordable price, which would not have been possible if the if the accountant hadn't been such a strong individual. As as you reduce debt and as you grow and as a company succeeds, Jeff, what happens is people start coming to you and saying, can I buy into your company? Can I have some stock in your company? And at that point, you don't want to sell your stock, but you have another good option. And that is the option to start satellite companies. Okay, we were a steel fabricating company, so obviously we had to buy millions of dollars of steel. So we found an individual who wanted to buy stock in our company, which already told me he wanted to be an entrepreneur, he wanted to have ownership. We said, well, but let's start another company. By reducing debt now, we could go to the bank and borrow money to start a separate company. So we were buying steel, so we started a separate steel warehouse company. And we were building machinery that required high-strength steel, a very particular type of steel. So we centered this warehouse business around this particular high-strength steel Today, that steel warehouse is one of the largest warehouse companies in the United States on that particular steel. Our company went to paper mills and power plants. We worked on boilers. So we had another individual come to us and say, you guys are manufacturing auxiliary equipment and repairing auxiliary equipment for large boilers. Boilers are, are pieces of equipment that Alabama Power has that they put coal in, they generate steam, the steam goes through turbines and generates electricity. In a paper mill where we are in the midst of the center of the paper industry, when you're making paper, the first thing you do is you go to the forest and you cut down trees and then you remove the bark. And the bark then is not used for making the pulp or making the paper. You have to dispose of it. So what the paper industry does is they'll take all this bark and they'll put it in a pile and they'll burn it in a boiler. And they will generate high pressure steam. They take the high pressure steam, expand it through a turbine and generate their own electricity. Then they will use the low pressure steam to go into what's called the digesters to cook the pulp. It's like a pot. So they cook the pulp and make what's called pulp that eventually goes onto the paper machine. So all around the south or really all around the world, you have an abundance of boilers. Our company manufactured the, and repaired the equipment that was not what you call high pressure, not thousand pound pressure, the auxiliary equipment that works at low pressures. So we had an individual come to us and say, can I join your company? And, well, we don't want to sell any stock. He, he wanted to have ownership. That's the key. So he said, well, we'll start another company. So having the accountant who made us reduce debt allowed us again to go to the bank and borrow money to start another satellite company, which was a boiler repair company. Today, they're doing around $30, $40 million. We also were buying a lot of welding rods and, and oxygen and acetylene. A gentleman came to us and said, look, I'm working for this welding supply company. I'd like to have my own business. Can I buy into your company? I'm sorry, but there's no stock for sale. Well, the accountant reduced debt, went to the bank, borrowed money, and started a welding supply company. Eventually, we had about five or six companies that really started that way by an individual wanting to have ownership in the company, but didn't have the know-how to do it, nor did he have the finances, she had the finances to do it. Thank goodness for the accountant. Suggestion seven. Without question, the most difficult aspect of managing a big company or a small company or your company or someone else's company is salary management. Extremely, extremely difficult. We had uh, superintendents Probably the most important people on the company was seven or eight superintendents who would go out in the site and, and wreck the equipment and so forth. And there's a big demand for these superintendents. So we would have a situation where the accountant and the salespeople would say, well, we're about to lose a superintendent. We can't lose him. Let's raise his salary. He's going to get more money at the competitors. You just can't do that because if you raise a salary for one superintendent, you have to do it for the other six superintendents. And, and that doesn't work. I don't know what the solution is other than to be associated with someone in management who has some, again, some accounting background. I, I think the accountant, by his nature, is just so pessimistic and he, that he, 
He's going to maintain keeping your cost at a very, very minimum. I talk about taxes. You read the paper so often about companies that get into financial trouble because they, they're in trouble with the IRS because they don't pay their taxes. Your, your accountant is going to have an outside accounting company that's going to audit your books and do all of your taxes, but you've got to be sure that every quarter you pay your taxes. You know, I'm ashamed to say such a fundamental thing to such a, a bright group of people, but there are companies that don't do that. There are absolute companies that don't pay their taxes. There's an article in the Birmingham paper about one of the CFOs at HealthSouth Corporation. He forgot to pay his taxes for two years. I mean, I, I don't know how that happens, but every quarter we paid our taxes and we had money to pay our taxes. Near the end, uh, I'm talking about a type of business, defining the type of business. And I talk about what's called an OEM. Do you know what I mean by that? An OEM is an original equipment manufacturer. Let's say that Dick Clark wanted to start a company. Like you're reading in a financial paper today about this company, a subsidiary of Ford that got in financial trouble. They made parts for Ford Motor Company. I can't think of the name of it. But I can understand why they're in trouble because they manufactured products for an OEM, which was Ford Motor Company. In my 30 years, I could never figure out how to make money selling a product to an OEM. I really couldn't. Because if you go to the OEM, the OEM has polished purchasing agents who do nothing but buy equipment. And they'll just knock you down and knock you down to the lowest dollar possible. We had a, a competitor of ours who really caused us terrible problems early in the creation of the company because he, he somehow was selling at a price lower than what we could. And I, I, we finally figured out he went bankrupt. But he, but he had a position in marketing that he was spending most of his time calling on OEMs. Now, in our industry, that was the boiler manufacturers, companies like Babcock, Wilcock, Combustion Engineering. But in Dick's business, if he's going to start a small machine shop, and he is going to manufacture a product for an automobile. It might be, uh, let's say, a, a steering wheel. I mean, that's a simple case. Uh, or, a, or a gasoline pedal or something like that. He has two choices. He can go to Ford Motor Company or General Motors Company and hope he can get a contract to supply these components for that automobile. But believe me, Dick, you're not going to make very high gross margin if you do that. Your alternative would be to go and sell that product as a replacement product to the end users, uh, then you can get a lot higher gross margin. One of my partners, who I love very dearly, came to us about eight years ago and said, I want to build a church. I want to sell my stock. So we bought him out. And he started an incredibly fabulous, huge Baptist church up in Birmingham. And after he built the, the church, he fulfilled his dream. He wanted to do something. So in his church, he got to know some of the uh, medical professors down at UAB, and they had come up with a formula for a vitamin or a nutritious pill, uh, a vitamin essentially. So he came up with this pill, and he went to a company in Georgia, and he manufactured it. And by this time, my partner didn't have much money left. He gave it all to the church, to be honest with you. So he did was not financially strong. So he had this vitamin, and he's figuring out how to sell it now. One thing, the easiest way to sell it would be to go to CVS or Rexall or Walmart. Say, look, how about you selling this for us? But you know that they're not going to give you anything for it. You're going to be working on a pencil-thin gross margin. So he's trying to sell it through manufacturer's reps. Do you know what I mean by a manufacturer's rep? You do, this? you, Jeff? Well, there are, there are company, there are individual people in different geographical locations that represent a number of companies. And they work strictly on a commission. And the idea is, if you're going to go with them, it's really a smart idea initially because you don't have the cost of hiring and training your own sales force. All you've got to do then is train, assist these people. So that's the concept that AT is going to try and do is get these people to go out and sell. But I keep saying to them, I say, AT, your big obstacle is how do you know, how do you evaluate the benefit of this? You know, it, that, that to me is the challenge. 
If they could do a blood test or something and you take your vitamins and after so many months you find that your immunity system is, is improved, I guess. But, I mean, he really, really has a problem in trying to market this product from this new company. I also had one other creed that I followed, as that was to be in the position, if I was working somewhere, whether it was for me or for someone else, to be in a position where I was constantly learning, constantly learning. Uh, at Lockheed, that first job I had sitting in the cubicle doing theoretical calculations, Mark, I wasn't learning anything. I mean, I was, I was miserable. And I said, I've got to get out of it. I've got to do something else. So for 35 years, I made a point of being in a position where I learn something, where you can learn constantly. I think if you're not learning at a particular position, Jeff, you've got to change. And I always taught my children, don't quit something. You've got to stick at it. You've got to be persistent. But if you're working at a vocation where you're not learning something, then you've got to, you've got to really question it and you've got to look at something else. In closing, I made some highlights if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, I don't like to use that word, but if you're thinking about becoming self-employed, you better have an accountant as a good friend, and you ought to put together a good business plan. Retire debt as quickly as possible, minimize startup costs, and handle the most difficult aspect of the company, and that's manage salaries properly and wisely. Pay taxes promptly. I'm, I'm sorry, but we have to add that. And you've got to grow the company strategically. You have to realize that every day, if you're not growing, your manufacturing costs are increasing. People are going to want cost of living raises. Price of steel is going up. So you've either got to increase your gross margin each year or you've got to increase your sales. And increasing gross margin is extremely challenging. So in your company, you've got to look at constant growth to take account of constant cost. You've got to train key employees to take over the company because you don't live forever. You uh, never compromise your ethical beliefs, never. In a private company, of course, you think, well, you may not be tempted, but we did have a situation after about two or three years, if you recall, most of, everyone in this room is too young to recall, I guess, but there was a period of time about 20 years ago where interest rates were about 18 or 19 percent. Does anybody remember that? It was really difficult. The banks came to us and said, I don't know how you guys are going to do it. So we had a time where we would re be required in those days to give the bank our monthly financial statements. And it would have been very easy, I guess, to be tempted to forge some numbers on those financial statements. But the five of us would never, ever consider anything like that. We had to come up with our own money at one time rather than cheat on the accounting statement. So I think ethics... What can you say? It, it has to be with you. It has to be ingrained with you. You have to be consistent with it. And then finally, you've just got to enjoy it. It's supposed to be an hour, but I've run out. There's no participation. Does... That's okay. We'll have some questions for you. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay. Um, before we actually uh, see if we've got any questions, I've got to say that I appreciated the, the uh, part of your story where you talked about how your father didn't include his own salary in his uh, business plan is the, his opportunity cost of going into business because that's one of the things we teach in principles of economics classes is if you're going to go from a salary to self-employment that you have to consider your, the cost of your time. And I always thought I was wasting the student's time with all of that analysis thinking that everybody must realize that. So the fact that your father didn't. <laughs> But Mark, in economics class, do they teach students how to put a business plan together? Is that part of the economics class? No, not in economics. Um, the business plan would come in uh, management courses, uh, mm -hmm. certainly by the time you get to uh, strategic management, for example. I would suppose the accounting classes would more than likely do that, I would imagine. I, being an engineer, I can remember all I ever had was one English course, uh, one economics course, and everything else was all technical. So I had to really rely on the accountant as, as, a, as, as he was so important. But he had to rely on me because he didn't have any vision of what the products would be. So we were totally dependent on each other. Three things, a comment, a suggestion, and then a question. My comment first is that you convinced me more than ever 
that no one ever had any business sitting in front of a podium to teach business classes unless they had some real world experience. You've been a delight to listen to the last 40 minutes or so. Second, the suggestion, which I know that it's extremely poor etiquette to uh, talk about changing the title of someone's speech, but folks here know I don't have any ethics on the book of the law anyway. It seems to me that a great change in the title would be you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand entrepreneurship. It would be a wonderful title for you. Finally, uh, a question coming from a man who married a banker and the best man at his wedding was an accountant. You're sitting at the Von Mises Institute and your, your clothes was just perfect. Never, ever uh, give up on your ethics or your, or your moral standard. It seems to me like somewhere in there you, you want to address, and I'll be interested to hear what your comment is, uh, it, it'd probably be nice to have a friendly politician. It seems like anybody today that wants to start up any business, whether it's a hot dog stand or you know building an automobile, the, the roadblocks that are put into place by the government are just insurmountable almost today as opposed to what they were 20 or 50 years ago. And you know, the stuff that I suffered at Ford Motor Company, when I first went to work for Ford Motor Company, the operating manual was about this big, and you had a couple of warranty and policy manuals. With cap regulations, emissions regulations, passenger strength regulations, I have no idea how young people get into the job that I did at Ford Motor Company and survive. It's just so overwhelming. You didn't even mention OSHA. OSHA. Of course. Well, that, that had always been there. Yeah, the, and, of course, they got worse as well. What, I think you're right. In starting the business, we really got zero help from the government. I think we well, seek the initial. No help. Yeah. Kind of help they often yeah. <laughs> but uh, in right, safety is such an important issue, and you have so many government regulations pertaining to safety, so many forms to fill out. Uh, that's just one aspect. But you're right. Uh, there's so many obstacles. There really are. And as the company grows, it becomes more complicated. And what's your advice to young people in dealing with those obstacles today? Well, I think if you. Start. I think we were just sort of naive when we started. We just had a dream. I, I think each of us were dissatisfied working for someone else. You know, I, I, I think the most enjoyable period I had in my life was when I graduated from college and went into service. I was a, a lieutenant. I had a platoon. Boy, that was so much fun to have responsibility for someone. So I think we all started a business because of dissatisfaction in working for someone else. And having someone else control how much money you're going to make. Uh, so I think when you start off, you're probably not worrying about these other obstacles that you're alluding to, but they manifest themselves pretty quickly. They really do. The uh, Having the outside accounting firm, uh, having a good relationship with an outside accounting firm uh, really, 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 really was a big factor. Uh, my partner being an accountant, he, yes, I gave him a lot of credit for the business plan, but he also ran the manufacturing plant. So he had the problems, is it going to be union or non-union? You know, that, some, that, that comes up. And, and our thought was, well, if they want to be union, let them be union. So, but the, the government obstacles are, are there. Yeah, they, like I talked about the lawsuit over the guy because he's had Polak. I mean, it's a true story. I bet, Ozzy, I bet you think I'm making it up, but I'm not. <laughs> So many questions, I'm just going to fill them all out, but, but two. Uh, one, I'm curious how the inflation of the late 70s affected you and, and your accounting standards, and uh, how you dealt with that. And then also to ask you about the, the, the boom of the, uh, the late 90s uh, and your assessment of the impact of, of that on all the accounting scandals that, that followed. Well, getting to the first one, Jeff, the, uh, that was a really, really difficult time. I'm, I'm 65, and I know I look like I'm 75. And it, it happened when we started the company, because right when we started it, interest rates did go to 18%, and we were financing everything. Uh, we were borrowing everything. And the bankers later told us that, I don't know how you did it. You shouldn't have done it. But the way we did it was our salaries were very, very low. Our travel expenses were very, very low. I remember our traveling in the car and going to a hotel. I didn't stay at Holiday Inns. I stayed at really, really cheap hotels where 4.30 in the morning the truckers would start their engines and they'd wake you up. So we kept our costs at an absolute minimum. 
And we eventually got to the point that we started getting some additional products developed that would carry higher and higher gross margins. So we are on subconsciously moving in a direction where our gross margin was increasing. So we somehow weathered that storm, but we, we just weren't taking any money out of the company. And it was, uh, you know, conservative management, I guess, is the answer. Now, back in the 90s, when they had the boom with the computer industry, again, in Birmingham, being in the steel, it really didn't affect us that much. It really, it really uh, it didn't affect us. What, what happened to us as time progressed, we got to the point where our sales costs started to come down, where we didn't have to go out and beg for business, not beg for business, but really work hard to attain business, because people don't want to work with a fledging, young, and sympient company. They want to go to a, a well-established company. If you're a, a plant engineer in a paper mill, if you make a bad decision over buying a product, you're going to pay for it. So it, obviously, they're going to want to go with a big, established company where their risk is minimum. So where we started to experience some relief, Jeff, was as time progressed and our customer base enlarged, we, our, our sales costs essentially started decreasing. I think that's accurate. I think all of a sudden people would start to come to us with inquiries rather than us going to them saying, would you be interested in buying this product? We All of a sudden they started coming to us. Where the real progress occurred was when the competitor, I mean, we had about four or five competitors, but we had one really key competitor who was driving our prices down. And about six, seven years ago, he ran into financial difficulty. And when we acquired him, then our margins went up, and uh, we almost had a monopoly on it to some extent. But uh, that pro- that success, you know, in the nineties, it, it really, really didn't have much effect on our particular group of companies. We were so ste- we were we were getting our business from the paper mills and the power plants and the steel mills. Yes. Some of the some of the worst managers you can get. Are those who have been extremely successful as key employees down the line, good at making widgets, therefore he's got to be good at being a manager. How do you guard against that? Making that mistake. How have you ever had any problems with that? Well, the closest I can come to is thinking that can a salesman be a good sales manager? And uh, the answer to your question is no. We did, we didn't experience it. All, all of the people in our company grew. We grew up as a family. We had young engineers, and when we hired engineers, I didn't go to Auburn or Mississippi State to look for the brightest engineer. I didn't want an engineer with all A's. I wanted an engineer who was diversified, a guy with B's and C's who was active in different things and who could communicate, who didn't have to do what I did and read Captains and Kings twice. And those people stayed with us, and we grew. So I, I guess we did not experience what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. I think that does exist. When I worked for uh, a big company, uh, well, when we went to work at Lockheed, I mentioned in that paper that, uh, gosh, in 1964, if you had an engineering degree, you had a job. And the supervisor had a job. I realized I was working for a guy that knew, I don't, how do I say this, technically knew less than I did. But, but the Peter principle does exist. I, I don't think we experienced it in our company. I think we controlled it. We had some people, for example, who wanted to be promoted to different positions and who they couldn't do it. Primarily, the specific one I'm thinking of is we had a particular salesman who was very, very good at selling. But when we put him into a regional sales position in charge of the Northeast, after about a month, all the salesmen and sales rep came to me and said, I'm not going to work for this guy. I mean, he was a hell of a good salesman, but he couldn't. He didn't know how to manage people. He didn't know how to encourage people, he discouraged them. So that's probably the best example I could think of, but it, it, the Peter Principle is there, yes. Yeah, Jeff? This is related to that. What makes a good employee? Well, I think uh, he, he has to begin, he has to, be, he has to be ethical to start off with. He has to be an honest person. But then he is created. He's motivated. He, 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 you develop him, I think. I, I think, uh, if he's a draftsman and he's going in and he's doing drafting all the time, you've got to go down and encourage him and talk to him and tell him he's doing a good job and tell him what he can do to be progressed, to be managing of the, of the debt department. 
If you can make that employer realize that he's not going to be in that position forever, that there's an opportunity for advancement, then you've got a good employee. Uh, one mistake I made was we had a, a gentleman who came to work for us, and he used, he used the Lord's name in vain, you know, all the time. And I, that's not the kind of guy you want in your company. You know, and that's a bad employee. And what are you going to do about a guy like that? Encourage him to leave. But I think a good employee, to answer the question, is someone that's ethically honest, a good person. Maybe he's a church-going person. Maybe he, uh, he's just a good guy. And you bring him into a position and you, and you teach him that he's not going to be there forever. He's going to be doing something different the next day and the next day and the next day. Hopefully, there's a place to promote him. I don't know. That's probably the most honest answer I can give. How the steel tariffs, uh, the Bush steel tariffs affect you? Well, it, not not too much because it had the same effect on all the competition. Uh, if we were paying more or less for steel, then the the competitors also were in the same position, and so our cost, the importance of our cost, was how relative it is to the competition. So it it didn't hurt us manufacturing wise, but it did um, destroy a lot of the business potential business we could get from the large steel companies. For example, Bethlehem Steel. Uh, they're they're no longer in business. I don't know if tariffs had anything to do with that. I think that was absolutely a case history of very, very poor management. I'll give you an example. Uh, up at Bethlehem Steel in Pennsylvania, they built a new coke plant. Uh, what you do with coke is you take coal and you put it in this process and you drive out all the impurities. So you end up with a almost pure carbon and you put that in the... Uh, in the furnace and you make steel. We went up there and I was trying to sell them three simple fans and uh, large fans. These are 5,000 horsepower fans, big as this room. And what's your name? Lou. 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 We went in there and they had four engineers from United Constructors. They were paying probably $150 an hour. They had a staff of about six people. And I went up there, I guess, four times to sell them. They must have spent as much evaluating the fan proposal as they did for the fans. And I said to myself, I said, these guys aren't going to be in business very long. And they weren't. But the steel tariffs hurt people like that, like, like U.S. steel. Um, they, they, a lot of the steel we were getting was coming out of Belgium. So it probably had negative effect on the big steel manufacturers. Bob, is, is your company, would it be considered a small company within your industry? I think the financial experts, you know, when they have these mutual funds, small companies, I think they consider anything under $500 million as a small or medium-sized company. Because uh, when you first started out talking about this subject, I was thinking, you know, this seems to me like an industry where the bigger you are, the more competitive you'd be and that you would have be able to drive out the smaller players in the market, and I was going to ask you about that, but it seems to me that a lot of what you had to say today was about the advantages that exist in a small company that don't exist in a large company, like the ability to, you know, pull in your uh, costs uh, at certain times and, and that sort of thing. Well, we were competing against very, very large companies, and we didn't always necessarily have the lowest price, but we probably had a better understanding of our costs. We had a better understanding of how to manipulate it and so forth. Uh, but as we, we did have small companies develop that, that competed with us. And, and um, for a period of time, those small companies do have a price advantage in some cases, I guess. I, and I'm trying to think... Uh, I don't, you know, our company, 150 million dollar a year, probably, you know, it's broken up now, but it, it, it at one time was probably one of the largest privately held companies in Alabama. I bet it was one of the t ten largest, but no one ever heard of us because we wanted it that that way. We never had our name in the papers or magazines because we didn't want competition to know what we were doing. So, the only way I could get to speak here was to invite myself. <laughs> no one ever heard of me. <laughs> I'm so very glad you did. Thank you very much. Thank you.